The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Well, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are. Um, welcome to Oxford Computer Group. My name is Hugh Simpson Wells, and today I'm introducing John Craddock from XT Seminars. Um, John has a lot to fit in, so he's asked me to be very brief, so I won't give him the build-up I would usually give him, but uh, he's a, an MVP in great demand by Microsoft and elsewhere, and so we're very grateful to have him uh, today. And so without further ado, I'm going to hand straight over to him for authentication without boundaries. John. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Hugh. Thank you. And welcome, everyone. It's, uh, I, I've got John Craddock, and I've actually been working in the identity space since the very early days of uh, 2000. I got very much involved in, in Microsoft's pre-release of Active Directory. And in fact, I, I was just looking the other day, and in 2004, I gave my very first presentation at IT Forum, which included uh, Active Directory Federation services. Um, so that's going back a little bit. So um, worth hanging on to my Twitter feed because I do at times uh, distribute uh, useful information. Okay, so let's get in and have a look at what we're going to cover. But before I do, I want to give you a warning. And the warning is the fact that Azure AD will change. There's no question about that. It's continuously evolving. So some of the information I present, you know, I may actually do a demo and things have changed in the UI. Nevertheless, the basic principles are exactly correct. Also, don't just look at something and think, wow, that's really cool. We're going to do that. Always test, document, and approve any changes before implementing in your production environment. OK, warning's over. Time to look at what our agenda is. And as Hugh said, it's a very full agenda. So I want to start with looking at today's identity challenges. Then we'll look at where Azure AD fits in. I want to talk about Azure AD users, because we have a number of types of users. Then looking at how we sign in on-premise users. And this is users that are in our own Active Directory, which we've synchronized up to the Azure AD. And there's been a lot of changes in that very recently. And two products actually went GA, so for general availability, last week. At, and it was announced at Microsoft Ignite. Uh, I then want to look at assigning applications to users, how we do that, registering our own applications uh, into Azure AD and also publishing our own apps. And for that, we're going to look at the Azure application proxy and then just reaching out to uh, partners and consumers, maybe with multi tenanted apps, B2B or B2C. So as I say, a lot to get through. So let's start off straight away with looking at today's identity challenges. And the problem we face today is that we've got resources which may be on our own premises. Maybe we need to get at resources that are partner uh, cloud, maybe a public cloud. Maybe we're going to be using Office 365. Or we've got some information that could be a partner private cloud. It could be our private cloud. We've got resources absolutely everywhere. And what we want to be able to do is allow our users using any type of device to be able to gain access to those resources. And we want those resources to be protected. And then we need to address sort of things like multi-hop scenarios. So here, a user accesses one resource, and that resource in itself goes off to a back-end system to gather other information to render to the user. And that might be done um, through using the identity of the user or might be done using the identity of the front-end server. And then we have another situation we need to deal with where a user signs into one service and gives permission for that service to act on their behalf to access a back-end system. And once they've done that, they may sign off from the front-end service and somehow we have to maintain a link and an authorized or, authorized or authenticated and authorized link to the back-end system. So lots of different scenarios. I like to think of it as anywhere, anyone, anything. So when we talk about anywhere, our application could be anywhere. 
any one means that we want to give access to our own users, but maybe we want to share information with our partners, or maybe we want to share information with our customers. So we're opening up our services to our customers. And then, of course, device anything. But this user that we're seeing uh, on the slide, where does he log in or where does she log in? And the answer could be anywhere. And we could be using identity from our own organization. So maybe it was our, our one of our users and we've got that user in our own on-premises Active Directory. Or maybe it's coming that user is a partner coming from their our partner's identity provider of some kind. And maybe that's not Active Directory, maybe that's something completely different. Or we might have the user's identity stored in some third-party enterprise identity provider. And a good example of that, of course, is Azure AD. And then, of course, there's the social identity providers. So if we're dealing with consumers, maybe we want them to be using you know, a Yahoo account to gain access. Somehow, we have to join all these disparate entities up together. And the way we do it is through federation. And if we look at the Latin roots of federation, it simply means trust. We're going to establish trust so that we can link everything together. And if we look at sort of federation protocol flow, and this is sort of regardless of what protocol you're actually using, the flows are all very similar. So our user goes to access application X, and the application X decides our user is not authenticated. Well, if our user had been authenticated, we might have a cookie to represent that authentication. But on the assumption that we don't have a cookie, application X detects we're not authenticated. And what it does is it sends us off by through a redirect, if we're using a browser as our client, we're being sent off through a redirect up to a security token service that that application trusts. Now we arrive at security token service and the first question the security token service is going to ask is, are you authenticated? And if you're not, maybe that security token service can authenticate you. Or maybe it knows of another security token service that can authenticate you. So we can redirect the user at this point off to another SDS. The user can authenticate with that one and bring back proof of authentication to the SDS we're slowing on this slide. But let's make it simple. Let's say we can be authenticated by this SDS. So the next job is to authenticate the user. Having authenticated the user, we produce a security token specifically for application X. And then the SDS will dig digitally sign that. So now we send back that security token and it arrives back in our user's browser and through the magic of HTTP redirects, HTTP posts, hidden forms, uh, we send that back to the app. And the app receives the token and what it will do is it will check that it is a valid token. So the first question it will ask is, is the token for me? Yes, the token is specifically crafted for an application. So it will have an audience on the token saying it's for app X. The next thing, it can check timestamps. And finally, it checks the digital signature. And that's where the trust comes in. It trusts tokens signed by the SDS that it trusts. And if it validates the token, what it will do is it will accept that that user is authenticated. And any claims on the token, it will accept that are genuine assertions about that user. And therefore, we've allow the user in because that's an authenticated user and we could make authorization decisions based on the claims on the token. So the page gets rendered back and we're done. Now the interesting thing is if we were sort of nicely sealed in our on-prem AD, application X would need to be running on a server which is part of our domain. Our security token service would be the KDC, which is part of our AD, and everything would be tightly coupled. But here, what we're doing is if application X trusts the certificate that that security token service issues, it doesn't matter where application X is. It could be on-prem, 
could be in a private cloud, could be in a public cloud, or we could even have it sort of hosted in a partner space. The key is that we're trusting that certificate. So what we've done is we've now got a situation where we can accept authentication without any physical boundaries, and it encompasses all services that trust the IDP or the security token service, if you like. So really, where is our boundary now? It is authentication. Traditional federation protocols were things like SAMLP um, and WS Star. WS Star is the protocol that Microsoft championed and used. It was WS Federation and also WS Trust. Both of those protocols use a very sort of heavyweight SAML token. And that SAML token beautifully describes things. So it, you know, it says this is an attribute, the attribute name, and then it gives the attribute value. Nicely described, very easy to look at and work out exactly what's being presented in the token. However, it's complex to parse, it's complex to produce, and it's also fairly heavyweight to transmit because these tokens can get fairly big. And the game changers were devices. And devices could actually have, I mean, I know a lot of the sort of iPhones and all the other phones of this world these days are actually very powerful, but they could have fairly minimal stacks in. And to have a heavyweight protocol was not ideal. Plus, we now need to support all sorts of different types of applications. So we've got native apps, and the native app could run on a mobile device. The native app could be running on our desktop. Single page applications are very popular. And a SPA, as in a single page app, is uh, JavaScript. So our browser connects up to the server, a whole bunch of JavaScript is loaded into the browser, and then everything works in the browser. So it's very quick. But when we want to render data to users, then we might want to call back-end systems. And that SPA application, or the SPA rather, has to be able to go to back-end web APIs, getting information on the user's behalf. And then we have the traditional web app. And the traditional web app we will want to sign into, but equally well, that traditional web app may need to go to a back-end system with our identity, or it may need to go to a back-end system with its own identity. And it may need to carry on going to a back-end system even when the users disappeared. So we have to have a concept of uh, renewable tokens, or we need the ability to refresh tokens. And then there's web APIs. Web APIs are dotted around all over the place that we need to be able to get access to in a controlled and a protected manner. And many of those web APIs are now REST APIs. So modern authentication protocols are the way we're going now. So you, OAuth 2 is for delegated access. And it allows a user to consent to one service accessing a user's data held by another service. So for instance, I connect to my front end web server, and when I authenticate to that, the web server will say, or, or the, the, the STS that does the authentication will say, do you consent to app one accessing web API one for these with these permissions on your behalf um, and the consent screens can actually get very complex and you can actually avoid consent screens completely for users uh, by giving administrative consent when we do a uh, when we're using OAuth 2 we have an access token to going to the back-end system layered on top of OAuth 2 is OpenID Connect and it adds authentication to OAuth 2, and claims are held in an ID token. So now we're actually authenticating to the front-end web, web server. The token format for these new protocols, well, is mandated for OpenID Connect to be a JSON web token, or it's referred to as a JOT. And these days, 
uh, JOTs are used in most OAuth 2 implementations. JSON Web Token, very nice. It's lightweight, it consists of a header, a body, and a signature. And the body sort of describes the data that's held. It's fairly intuitively obvious. So, ORD is for audience. So, this is who the token's for. ISH is the issuer. Who issued it? IAT, issued at. And that's an epoch time that you can see there. And I'm not going to go through all the details of the token here. So, where does Azure AD fit in? Well, Azure AD is a service where we can become a tenant. So we have a tenant in the Azure AD space, and that's where we hold our data. Microsoft looks after everything else. So how do you back it up? You don't. Microsoft looks after that. How do you make it highly available? You don't. Microsoft looks after that. So they're looking after the infrastructure completely. What we do is manage the data. And currently, there's two management portals. Uh, one will be retired at the end of this year. Um, there's PowerShell and there's graph APIs that we can access so we can programmatically access that to get our data. And we can also take our users from on-prem AD and replicate them into the cloud. And we'll see, we'll talk about that in more detail in a moment. But once we've got our user in Azure AD, it just opens up authentication boundaries. So now that user authenticates once to Azure AD and they can get at your own apps, which you've published up there, maybe partner apps, applications from gallery. And there's a gallery of apps that Microsoft help you create single sign-on solutions for. And of course, there's Office 365 and the Azure subscription itself. Sign in once, access to everything. So in terms of benefits, Azure AD will allow us to authenticate to apps. We can use the modern authentication protocols, which if we're using you know, devices, mobile devices, we will certainly be using. If you're designing new systems, you will probably, well, you should be certainly looking at using OpenID Connect and OAuth 2. However, you may well have to work with legacy protocols. So Azure AD supports WS Federation and also SAML. We can even support Windows Kerberos authentication via the Azure AD application proxy. So let's say you want to publish a Windows Auth app, which is on-premises, and make it available to Azure AD users. You can do that through the application proxy. There's lots of self-service. So self-service for password resets, self-service for application access, self-service for group management. And we can also have, for application and group manager, we can have workflow associated with that. MFA, MFA is really simple to deploy. So very simple MFA solution, very simple yet very powerful. Probably one of the most powerful features is conditional access. So I can actually build a, a series of conditions before I will allow someone to access an application. I'll show you that in a demo in a moment. Another major, we're putting all our eggs in one basket. So another major feature of Azure AD is identity protection. And this gives the ability to actually profile users' behavior and identify them as being at risk or not being at risk. A sort of typical example of that is, are they signing in from an anonymous IP address, which would be rather strange because that would imply they're coming out the back end of a torrent tunnel, which we probably should flag. Have they done something with impossible travel? So have they logged in in New York, logged in in London, and then logged in in Dubai within a short space of time? Maybe that's a risk. But it may not be a risk because we may have sort of three VPN outlets in different locations. So the identity protection is tied up with machine intelligence to actually mine the data and work out behaviors. And of course, beyond that, there's more features which we haven't got time for at all today. 
So there's different flavors of Azure AD. Uh, there's a free, there's a, the, the maximum one is the premium P2. I'm not going to go through the details of this slide, but I have put a link at the bottom, which has a very useful table where you can compare features. Let's start off with a demo. And what I want to do is to start off, I'm going to go into my Azure portal. And we see we're logged on at Tor at Phi.users. And Tor actually has access to a number of different directories. I'm going to work with the this one, the MSC4A directory. I'm going to go in now to the Azure Blade. And we can see that we've got user groups, enterprise applications, devices, app registration, lots and lots of stuff we can work with. But let's just have a look at users and groups. And then we'll choose all users. And having chosen all users, we can see that we've got various users that look slightly differently. We've got different usernames with different suffixes. Uh, what do they all mean? Well, one of the ways we can do is we can turn on columns and we've got look at the source of identity and also we can look at the user type. So if we look at um, our, let's, let's start with our admin up the top is from the Azure Active Directory. This is a cloud only user. And notice this user type is a member. We come down here to Debbie Francis. She's a Windows Server AD source of authority. So she's come from our on-prem AD and replicated into Azure AD. And then what we can see here is we've got, um, if I just highlight that out, we've got some user type of guests. And these users are users that have been invited into our directory uh, through the B2B process. And I will come back on the B2B process later. But they've been invited in. They're now guests in our directory. So we can control which applications they actually have access to. So let's um, go and ha now have a look at uh, one of the items. Say, let's password reset. Uh, where we can do self-service password reset and configure this. Very simple interface. Uh, we select a group of users where we want to uh, have the password reset done. We could do it on individuals who want to. And then we choose an authentication method. So this is the method that we'll use to authenticate the user when they do a password reset. And you can see you can choose one or two authentication methods. I've got one chosen. So when a user does a password reset, they will need to confirm that by email or they can confirm that by mobile phone. If I switched on two, they would have to do both of those options. So I just wanted to show you how we can see this. Uh, or There's a lot of things that we can configure very, very easily. Um, what I want to do now, though, is go down to conditional access, which I mentioned previously. So here, I've got a conditional access policy called MFA1. And MFA1 is applied to uh, an individual user in this particular case. But of course, it could be to a group of users. So I've got David Grimm, which I've applied it to. And I can choose also which application I apply it to. So I'm applying it just to one application. So if you're David Grimm, and you're going to this application, and then I can set some conditions. So for instance, I could look at David Grimm's risk profile and see if he's been flagged as having high risk, medium risk, et cetera, uh, via the identity protection. So I can add him in here, make a decision. I can choose the device platform. So is he using an iOS, an Android device, and so on? Uh, I can choose his location. And I've just chosen, actually, to go for all locations. So my condition is David Grimm, uh, if it's him, and he's trying to go to the management portal, and he's coming from any location, let's just check, client apps. So I haven't made it set this in, but I could just say if he's coming from a browser, or he's coming from a mobile app. Um, but we'll leave that one, and let's see what we're asking to happen. So we can close those two off, and we'll say, if those conditions are met, we require multi-factor authentication. But I can actually have multiple controls applied. So this is unbelievably powerful in terms of controlling access 
uh, in terms of who can log on, but equally well, how can you get to an application? So I'm going to go over to my app, which is an app I use in the masterclass, which is a sort of test framework, because one of the things we do in the masterclass is really understand all the protocols and the flows involved with those protocols. But I'm going to go in with hybrid flow here, and I'm going to sign in as David. So remember, David is my guy who's got the conditional access policy against him, and David successfully signed in. And if you want to understand what codes are and how you configure the audience and everything else, uh, do come on the class. So David successfully did that. Now let's go and let's go to the management portal. So I'm going to go to portal.azure.com and immediately it's asking for MFA. So just wait till I get the code. So I'm waiting for the code to come in on my phone. Here we go. And we got the code, put the code in and complete the sign-in. So one application, we didn't require MFA, and another application, we did. So you can see the power behind conditional access policies. Okay, we've briefly mentioned Azure AD users, so let's look at those in a little bit more detail. We could have a cloud-only user. This user just exists in Azure AD. And we can enhance that user experience by taking a Windows 10 device and joining it into Azure AD. That user can now authenticate to the Windows 10 device using an Azure identity. And once they've done that, um, there's a primary refresh token is deployed onto the Azure AD device, which now opens up to all the applications. So now we've got single sign-on to absolutely everything. But this is a cloud-only user. If we want to take our on-premise users, we need to replicate them or synchronize them up into Azure AD. And we sync users, groups, and devices. If we use some of the features, such as password write-back, um, or device write back or group write back, we can enable that again so we can take information that's input to Azure AD and write it back to on premises. And this is all done by Azure AD Connect, which is a synchronization engine, but actually it's more than just a sync engine. So it's got some additional features. So if we look at Azure AD Connect, it's a replacement for earlier tools, and you can upgrade. I highly recommend that you upgrade and get yourself on Azure AD Connect today. So what does it do beyond being a synchronization engine? Well, it manages user sign-in options, and we'll come to those in a minute. It's doing the right back for password, devices, and groups. It's got tools, if you do use ADFS, as part of your sign-in process. It has tools for actually managing the SSL certificates on ADFS. It fixes trust, it does logon testing as well. And very importantly, it has an Azure AD Connect Health Agent, which reports status to Azure AD Connect Health portal, which is in our Azure. And if we look at the portal, what it does is it gathers information from all of our identity infrastructure. So yes, we get an agent on Azure AD Connect, but equally well, we can deploy one on ADFS and we can deploy it onto our on-premise AD. So we have a one-stop shop for reporting on all of our identity infrastructure. So usage reports, monitoring and alerts, and so on. Sign-in methods, and this is something that's changed uh, in terms of going for general availability very, very recently. So for all of these methods, we need our users synchronized from on-prem AD. So now they're in the cloud as well. Password hash synchronization. Now, this has been around for a while, and it was actually Microsoft sort of sold it as password synchronization. And people threw their hands up in horror because, you know, the, the chief security officer says, no way are you going to put my passwords in Azure AD. And it was badly sold because the reality is 
that your passwords are not synced up into a zero AD. Stored in the on-premise AD is an MD4 hash of the password. And before that leaves your on-premise infrastructure, what will happen is the MD4 password hash will be taken, it will be expanded, it will be salted, and then it goes through a thousand iterations of HMAC SHA-256. And that is the hash that's stored up in a zero AD. So if you did manage to attack a zero AD and steal all the hashes, they're useless to you. Computationally, they're really difficult to brute force attack. And because they've been salted, they're protected against rainbow attacks. So password hash synchronization is a very useful way of actually uh, signing in. So what's happening now when you log in, your username is up there from your on-prem AD and your password is on there. So we don't, um, we've got immediate sign in to Azure AD. Password authentication, this has just gone GA. And what happens here is um, Azure AD gathers your username and password and it sends it to an on-prem AuthN agent. And the first AuthN agent gets uh, deployed with the Azure AD Connect and you can deploy further ones. Uh, a maximum of three is recommended. It will probably deal with most situations. Um, it, the agent auto upgrades. So if you want full tolerance, you do need three agents deployed because one could be offline while it's being upgraded and you've still got two to give you your high availability. What happens now, you put your username and password in and it's passed down through to on-prem AD to be validated. And the last option there is federation with the ADFS. Here, when we put our username in, it detects the fact that that user is federated or from a federated domain and then immediately sends the user down through a redirect to the on-premise ADFS and you'll be going through the web application proxy and then using ADFS, you sign in to on-premise AD. So those, those are our three options for signing in our user. And if we look at federation, it's the most expensive option. We need to have an ADFS farm, so we need a minimum of two ADFS servers. If we're coming from the internet, we need a web application proxy farm. Uh, it's just been announced that, that you can now use F5 instead of a web application proxy farm, and that's now supported fully as a WAP replacement. But of course, there's quite a cost associated with it. If we look at adding seamless SSO, again, which just went GA, it works with both pass-through authentication and password sync, and users only need to type their name to authenticate to a zero AD. And if we use what's called login hints or domain hints, uh, we won't even need to type our password. Um, it's supported for Windows 7 and above. Um, Edge is currently not supported, but it's a work in progress. Uh, and you do have to be connected to your on-premise AD. And what happens is, in essence, we authenticate against a zero AD using a Kerberos token. If you want to understand, again, how all of this works and what's going on under the hood, it's something we spend, again, spend quite a bit of time on in the masterclass. OK, let's do a quick demo of this. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to just look in the portal and I'm going to look at Azure AD Connect in the portal. And what we can see is we've actually got in here, we've got seamless SSO. Uh, enabled and we've got pass through authentication enabled. Okay, so let's experience that. I'm going to go, I've actually got SSO disabled at the moment um, because of a browser configuration. So I'm going to go first of all to sign in with hybrid flow. And as I say, SSO is not enabled. I'm signing in as an on prem AD user. So john at 5.ad.xshub.com. And it logs me in. Let's just go to my DC and let's disable the account. So I've disabled the account. Now, normally, this could take up to 30 minutes to replicate. But if we go and try again and sign in with hybrid flow, once we put our password in, let's see the result. Okay, the account's locked. 
So immediately it's reflected. The reason being it's immediately reflected is we're going down to on-prem AD to actually do the authentication. So I've just enabled it again. So let's try again. And immediately we're in. Okay. Now, what I want to do is I want to add to our URLs that are necessary for SSO to work or seamless SSO to work. And of course, we can deploy these through group policy. So let's just find them. I've got them there. And we'll take the first one and we'll pop it in there. Add that in. And then take another one, which is the other, is that one. And again, pop it in. Add that, close that off. OK. And OK, let's try and let's have a look at the experience now. And we go to, let's try going here first with hybrid flow. And what we can see is we click on John now. And what it's done, it's automatically, John is logged into this workstation and it's automatically logged him in without the need to provide a password. And if we actually have a look at using domain hints, and here we've got a app which actually sets a domain hint, which is basically says where which domain our user is from. And we go over there and we now automatically SSO without even needing to supply the user's name. And this also works with the access panel. So again, now we've got complete seamless SSO with pass-through authentication. Two real drivers, so our passwords are kept on premises and we've got SSO, which were two real drivers for deploying ADFS. So maybe we don't need ADFS anymore. Okay, assigning uh, applications to users, if we want to do that, then uh, we've got SaaS apps. And in terms of SaaS apps, we could have lots and lots and lots of apps we want the user to get access to. And if we had individual accounts for all those apps, it would be a complete nightmare. Uh, not only remembering passwords for users, but provisioning and deprovisioning. So awesome accounts left everywhere. So the solution is to use Azure AD with SSO. And there's a gallery of apps that help you configure SSO. And you can set up with Federation, we can use a password vault, or we can use an existing SSO solution. So in terms of password vaulting, credentials are stored securely in Azure AD and automatically populated into the browser when a user goes to a particular resource. Um, and the credentials can be managed by the user or, or admin. We can also set up a single SaaS account uh, for, for a group of users. It's really, really useful for the corporate Twitter account, the LinkedIn corporate account, and so on. So we have a group of users using the same credentials, getting access to the same account. Um, supported on uh, most browsers, including Edge now. 2,800 SaaS apps, um, your app will appear in the access panel. Let's have a very quick look at that. So I'm going to go into uh, uh, my portal and I'm going to actually go and go to the enterprise apps. So we'll go to enterprise apps here and I'm going to go for a new application. I'm going to choose an application, and I've got various ways of choosing the app, but I'm going to go for one from Gallery. So I'm going to go down here, and I'm just going to go for LinkedIn. That's going to go to my Gallery, and I'm going to add it. So I'm now adding LinkedIn as an application that will be available to all of my users. Okay, it comes up with a whole bunch of help. Um, well, I'm going to assign a user. And it says sign for testing, but this is just a test, first of all. And then we can assign users at any time. And I will just sign a user rather than a group of users. So I'm going to go for my user, John. So John Williams is selected. We'll assign him. And the next thing we need to do is set a, uh, a single sign-on method. And for LinkedIn, what we're going to use is we're going to use a password-based sign-on. So we'll select password base sign on. We'll save that. 
And remember, we've assigned this to John. So let's now go and have a look at John's experience. So we're going to go off to uh, the access panel. Let's go this time with, we won't use a domain hint on the access panel. We'll just go direct so we can see we're going in as John. And what we should find inside the access panel is we have an app for John now. And we're going to go to LinkedIn. And this is the first time John has used this app, so he's going to have to supply the credentials for LinkedIn. So we're going to go in, and John at, uh, well, it's just my, uh, my email account, which everybody knows anyway. I'm not going to tell you my password. So we'll go in, and now we're into LinkedIn. And hopefully, if I've got the password right, so credentials are updated in Azure AD. And this should take us over to LinkedIn, which it has. And I did put the credentials in correctly. So that's good. And now let's just actually have a look and go in now with a full single sign-on experience. So directly using domain hints, I'm single signing on into Azure AD as John. And I click on LinkedIn. And now I've got a single sign-on experience into LinkedIn as well. So this is um i think it's pretty cool these days that this is now working really really well okay so if we want to register our own applications what we need to do is uh, we need to create an application template and the templates themselves can get fairly complex some of it can be done through the ui some of it is done with a manifest file when the, that app is used for the very first time, a service principle is created in your tenant to represent the application. And one of the things we'll do is when setting up the registration of the application, we'll define the backend permissions it needs to go to other web services. The reason being is that we need to define the consent that is required. Uh, there are new V2 endpoints which are coming out. They're in development at the moment, which use dynamic incremental consent, which will do away with the, the need to actually set up the relationship with a back-end app. Um, that's currently in development, and there's a new app registration portal. Um, if we want to publish a Windows integrated authentication app, we can do that through the Azure AD application proxy. And what that does is it publishes a public URL and then creates a secure connector, which is going to an on-premise AD connector. The on-premise uh, AD connector, well, the with the on-premise connector, which is sitting in our environment, creates an outbound connection to Azure AD. And then we can publish a Windows Auth app. So as a very quick demo of that, what I want to do is just go into the portal and I want to go to application registration and we're going to the app registration in here and I'm going to just choose an app. Now, the reason I want to show you this is because uh, what I find is developers are taking over the registration of the app and we're finding that the the ops people are losing control of their Azure AD. And it's really important that we understand what's going on in here. Uh, so for instance, the relationship between the front end app and the back end apps, we need to set all that. And you know, you've got to take control of your Azure AD back from the, the dev guys. And because you are operations of your IT pros and looking after it. So really, really important. And we can get very complicated here. We can start editing manifest files. And we spent a lot of time actually understanding this from an IT pro perspective in the masterclass. I just want to show you before finishing this, just going to the web application proxy and into the web app proxy. And there we're signing in as John. We've come to the authenticated and we've got a Windows integrated authentication, authentication app set up. Okay, finally, I just want to finish off just talking very briefly about reaching partners and customers. And here, what we can do is create a multi-tenanted app, and that 
multi-tenanted app can be available to all other tenants in Azure AD. And it's a relationship between the app and every other tenant, uh, which means the app can we can create a token to authenticate any user to that app. And it's up to the app to decide whether that user's allowed in and whether that tenant's allowed in. So the application is in control. A different approach is to use B2C. With B2C, what we do is we invite another user to come into our tenant and they come in as a guest. If you remember, we saw those guest users right at the beginning. So they come in as a guest, and as a guest, we have full control over them. We can assign them to applications. We can assign them to groups. And if we don't like them anymore, we can just remove them. So in this particular case, we've invited someone from B into A. And lastly, there is Azure B2C, where the B2C is a, a new directory. We're actually publishing an application. We've got user objects, and what we're doing is we're setting up policies to allow automatic sign-up of users. We can have different identity providers, so Microsoft, Google, um, Amazon, and so on. And we can create ways of signing up. We can have editing profiles, and so on. OK, I'm not going to have time to do this demo, which I'd love to do, but I'm going to um, actually just say, where next? Well, I've been mentioning the masterclass. Do come on our masterclass. It's available uh, throughout Europe, and also um, Oxford Computer Group are hosting it and um, looking after it all in the US and the UK, which is absolutely fabulous. I hope to meet you there. I do have a blog, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to hand you back to Hugh. Hugh. Wow. Well, thank you, uh, John, for a <laughs> characteristically fast flow of information. Uh, everybody, if you have questions, do type them into the, uh, the question uh, box, and we'll try and answer them. Uh, we've got one question, which we'll try and answer uh, in a moment. Uh, also, if you've got any comments about the session, you can put them there as well. While you're thinking about that, I'm just going to put up a poll. And there we go watch that and we'd just like to know if you would be interested in the masterclass which uh, John's referred to this is five days in which obviously he'll be going into an incredible amount more detail than he's been able to hear uh, but we'd like to uh, get some answers to that I see interestingly quite a few people are definitely interested lots of people thinking about it thank you for your uh, responses uh, you've seen the quality of John's presentation, style and content, so if you're interested in that five-day course, um, let us know. We'll get back to you. So, John, I don't know if you can see the questions. Uh, have you, uh, can you see the questions coming up okay? I, I can indeed. And, 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 and in a way, I, I'd love to have had lots more time, but you know, we, we were trying to give you a, a good overview. There's, there's just so much depth we can go into in so many areas. And, that, and that's why the masterclass is five days. So we've got a chance and 35 hands on, so you really get into it. OK, well, um, first question was about uh, integration with, with Okta. Um, or, or, but what I'd like to, uh, Okta is, um, if you like, a one of these third-party enterprise providers, um, and I'd like to sort of open that up into a more general sort of question: Is can we uh, integrate in with uh, other identity providers? And the answer to that is absolutely no problem at all. Um, what what um, what are the the real things though in terms of identity protection is we've got to have Azure AD as the primary identity source. So we're we're that way we can examine our AD users. Um, will will the slide deck be available? Um, it, it will. It could be available in PDF form. I don't know. Is that something you're going to make available, Pew? Well, I think importantly, we'll make uh, a video of this available. So, if any, you know, if you want to watch it again, that's fine. Uh, I think that will be our, our preferred uh, route, actually. Um, so, uh, we'll get back to you on that. We'll 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 send a, a wrap up email. Okay. Um... And there don't, doesn't actually seem to be any other questions. Lots of thank yous, which is very nice. And thank you very much for your comments. Um, if you've got any other questions, we, we do have another couple of minutes to uh, to be able to, to answer those. 
And if not, I just thank you from myself for coming along. And, and thank you, John. Fantastic. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, everybody. I thank you for your time and uh, we'll be in touch.